Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief uh, introduction to irreversible thermodynamics and then we'll carry on with uh, the kinetics of growth in multi-component systems. So um, the first slide here shows you different states of equilibrium. So this is what we normally regard as, uh, as the mechanical equilibrium of a ball. So if I give it an infinitesimal perturbation, it will come back to its original position. And a metastable equilibrium means that there will be another lower free energy minimum. Okay? But from our point of view, we can't really distinguish between metastable equilibrium and equilibrium because you give an infinitesimal perturbation, again the ball will come back to its original position. Unstable equilibrium is where, you know, if I give it a perturbation, uh, then it will cascade to a lower free energy state. And the situation on the extreme uh, right is basically unstable. It's not equilibrium at all, right? And that last situation we need to distinguish between the um, case where there's a steady state, that means there's a ball rolling down that hill, but if you're an observer on that ball, you don't actually see anything changing around you because there's a constant slope there, right? So energy is being dissipated, but it's steady state in the sense that, you know, you don't observe a change if you're located on that ball. Whereas uh, in, in this case, the rate of energy dissipation is actually changing according to your location on that slope. So thermodynamics deals with equilibrium, right? That means, you know, uh, there's no change no matter how long you observe the system. Kinetics is the situation illustrated in the middle where, you know, the driving force might be changing during the course of the transformation because the composition of the matrix is changing. And steady state is when the rate of energy dissipation is constant. Okay, is everyone happy with that? So, uh, kinetic theory is uh, very difficult because uh, there are just too many variables involved, but the steady state allows us to make an approximation between uh, kinetics and thermodynamics. Okay, so we are going to refer to the steady state. And uh, we need to define what we mean by a process which is reversible and one which is irreversible. So imagine that we've got a, a cylinder of gas containing an ideal gas, right? That means, you know, uh, it obeys the um, PV equals NRT law. And it's a frictionless uh, piston, okay? So if I change uh, either the pressure or volume slightly and then go back to the original state, it simply follows along this curve, okay? There's no actual loss of energy if I start from a particular point on that curve and then return to that point, okay? Now, that's a reversible process. In this case, there is some friction between the piston and the uh, cylinder. So, in order to get things moving, I've actually got to apply uh, a certain pressure. It then moves along this curve. When I relieve that uh, pressure, it doesn't actually move back until you get to a, a lower, uh, until you get to this point, and then it follows through. So, what's the energy dissipated in this process? A area in that curve, okay? So this is, this is not uh, what we call a reversible process. This is an irreversible process because you've expended some energy, okay? Everyone happy with the definition? So when we think about diffusion, you know, diffusion is happening actually along a free energy gradient, right? That means you're going from a higher free energy state to a lower free energy state. So that definitely is dissipating energy and is an irreversible process. Now, um, I'm going to state this without any proof for the moment, and even when I do give you the proof, it will be a bit woolly, because uh, 
the thermodynamics of irreversible processes relies on a certain number of assumptions which you can only prove by experiment whether they are cor uh, correct or not and what the limits of those approximations are you can only prove by experiment. So imagine that we have a flux J right? and this is a generalized flux. Flux means the rate of flow of something and we have a force x which is driving that flux right so that could be a free energy gradient could be a temperature gradient driving heat flow etc then the rate at which energy is dissipated is the temperature times the entropy production rate so sigma here is the entropy production rate so you know if I multiply entropy by temperature, I get an energy. So if I multiply the entropy production rate by temperature, I get the uh, free energy dissipation rate. Okay? So this equation tells you that the energy dissipation rate will be the product of the flux and the force, x. And furthermore, if that is the case, if I can write an equation like this relating a flux and a force, um, then I should be able to uh, say that the flux is proportional to the force. Okay? So here is an example where we've got a current and we've got a voltage. So what is the flux and what is the force? Yeah. So the current is being driven by the voltage. Voltage is the x and the current is j. And you know we have Ohm's law, which says that the current is proportional to the voltage. All right, so J is proportional to X. Now, I don't know whether if the current is huge, will this law still hold? Uh, you know the linear relationship between the current and the voltage will that still hold? Uh, there, I, I cannot predict that. The only way you can do things is by experiment to see whether it holds at extremely high uh, values of uh, potential difference or current. It's actually quite difficult to do an experiment to prove that it holds at very large currents because of the heat that you generate. Yeah. Okay. So what is the energy dissipation rate? Yeah. Current times voltage, J times X. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's just think about that linear relationship again. So if I just take the flux and I do a polynomial expansion about the force, right? Because I don't actually have a theory relating J and X. So I do a polynomial expansion, then you know, I get a term uh, with um, J of zero, then J dashed of zero into X and J double dashed of zero into X squared upon two. So can you help me simplify this? What do you normally do when you have a polynomial to simplify things? Sorry? Yeah, so if, if the driving force is small, then we can ignore high order terms, all right? Yeah, and uh, that uh, that tells you that maybe the theory only applies at small driving forces, but is there any further simplification? Uh, the flux at uh, zero driving force is zero. Exactly, so the flux at zero driving force is zero, so we recover that J is proportional to X, okay? But we realize that that can only be true if X is small, and I can't tell you how small x has to be for that approximation to work. Now, have you come across this previously? Uh, um, let's consider a case where the flux is not proportional to the force, but becomes proportional to the force when the force is small. So, uh, the case in hand is about an interface, and the rate of interface movement is controlled by the transfer of atoms across an activation barrier. So we are plotting uh, free energy on this axis and a coordinate. 
along here and this is A and this is the position B. This is the driving force uh, delta G for atoms to jump from the left to the right and this is the activation barrier Q. So the probability of atoms jumping from A to B A to B is going to be proportional to exponential of minus Q over K T this is just the Boltzmann condition and for the reverse jumps B to A it will be proportional to exponential of minus Q plus delta G over KT because the barrier height for re reverse jumps is delta G plus Q. Therefore we expect the velocity in the forward direction forward direction to be proportional to exponential of Q upon KT minus the reverse jumps which is exponential of minus Q plus delta G upon KT which is equal to exponential minus Q upon KT into 1 minus exponential of minus delta G over KT. Now this term here is approximately equal to approximates as delta G when delta G is small. Okay. Therefore, the velocity is proportional to delta G when the force is small. But not so if delta G is large, the relationship is nonlinear when delta G is large. So this illustrates that uh, basically the proportionality between the flux and force works when the force is small in this particular case. Okay, and uh, here's a, another example where we have heat flow being driven by a temperature gradient uh, delta T. And that obeys uh, Fourier's law, which tells you that the uh, heat flux is proportional to delta T, right? And we have Fix's uh, law of diffusion, where you write the flux is proportional to the concentration gradient. Okay? Now, we know that actually it's not proportional to the concentration gradient, but to the free energy gradient. So if instead of Fix's law, we write that the flux is proportional to the gradient of the chemical potential, d mu a by dx is now the gradient of the chemical potential, and that is called a mobility, right? So instead of the diffusion coefficient, we have a mobility. And because the chemical potential is dependent on the concentration, you now get the natural result that the diffusion coefficient will vary with chemical composition. Okay? Yeah, so it's, it's not actually constant, but it will vary as a function of the chemical composition. The reason why we have a concentration here is we are, we are actually working out the free energy of the A atoms in a solution of a certain concentration. Mu A is just the chemical potential. Multiplied by the concentration, you get the free energy. Okay? Right, so if I compare these two equations, then I can relate the diffusion coefficient to the chemical potential, and that defines the composition dependence of the diffusion coefficient. So if the free energy curve of the solution is shaped like so, 
where we have A, B, the components, and this is the free energy. And the free energy curve is shaped something like this. Then when I draw a tangent to this curve, which touches at this particular value of concentration, that gives me the chemical potential of atoms B at the concentration C1. And that gives me the chemical potential of A atoms corresponding to the concentration C1. Now, if I increase the concentration, then the chemical potential also increases. So here we have mu B of C2, where C2 is this larger concentration. So you can see that the chemical potential of B has increased. In other words, D mu B by DCB is greater than zero. Uh, therefore, the diffusion coefficient will be positive. Therefore, the diffusion coefficient is positive and the flux will go down a free energy gradient and down a concentration gradient. The flux goes down a free energy gradient and concentration gradient, as in Fix's law. As in fix law. So this kind of a situation arises when A atoms prefer to be next to B atoms and therefore we have a free energy minimum uh, when we have a good mixture of A and B atoms. Uh, in contrast, if my free energy curve looks something like this, so that there are minima at low concentrations of B and at high concentrations of B, uh, which means that like atoms prefer to be next to each other. So this is an A-rich solution and this is a B-rich solution. Uh, on this particular plot, if I draw a tangent to the curve at this point, okay, so that's my concentration C1 and that will be mu B at the concentration C1 and for another higher concentration, mu B of C2. Uh, we have D mu B by DC B is less than zero and therefore the diffusion coefficient becomes negative negative and this gives us uphill diffusion. That is against a concentration gradient. So a homogeneous solution will tend to develop A rich and B rich uh, clusters uh, given uh, time for diffusion to occur. Okay, so there are many examples like this where you know you have a force and a flux, you multiply the two, 
and you get the free energy dissipation rate and you find that the flux is proportional to the force provided that um, the force is small enough. And the last example is stress and strain rate. You know, the area under a stress strain curve is the energy per unit volume. So if I multiply stress and strain rate, I've got the energy dissipation rate when you're deforming a material. Okay. Okay, so this is the real point that I wanted to get to. So in all of the examples we've considered so far, you have just one force acting and one flux. Okay? But supposing you have a combination of a temperature gradient and an electrical current. Yeah? Or you have a, a concentration gradient of one element, but a flat concentration of the other one. Okay? So these two fluxes will begin to interact but the same equation still applies that, look, if I write the energy dissipation rate, then it's now the sum of the products of all the forces and fluxes. Okay? And I can, I can do the same thing, that uh, if I write the force is proportional, uh, sorry, the flux is proportional to the force, then in the case of a system where I've got uh, uh, several forces acting, the flux of one will be proportional to the force of one and to the force of another uh, species. So here, for example, J1 doesn't just depend on X1. It also depends on X2. And similarly, J2 depends on X1. Okay. So, you know, I gave you the example of a thermocouple where a difference in temperature is actually driving an electrical current not just heat flow. Okay. So there are many, many cases. The Peltier effect is the opposite, where you put an electrical current and you get a temperature difference between two points. Right? All those are basically multiple forces and fluxes acting together. And I don't want to go into this, but if you think about the reversibility of the process, then you'll find that this applies, okay, that Mij is equal to Mji, except in the case of uh, magnetic properties where you have that minus sign, all right? So this is not important. The main thing is that we can write equations that the flux of one will be related to all the forces that are acting, not just its own term. So are the basic principles uh, clear? Okay, we can move on to uh, what we really want to do, which is there are no iron carbon alloys of any consequence at all. You know, all iron alloys contain other elements as well. And some of them might be there as impurities and others are there as deliberate additions. But you know, the, the remarkable effects that alloying elements have on the growth kinetics of all the phases in, in the steel allows you enormous versatility. So you can get strength levels from something like 50 megapascals to uh, about 20 gigapascals by controlling the structures. And, and you know, strength is not the only property that we need to worry about. Any fool can make a very strong material, but you need a whole bank of properties to make a component. I'll, I'll give you some examples later. Okay, so just a, a revision again. When we were dealing with the binary system, we could define the conditions at the interface by drawing a tie line at the transformation temperature. Okay. And that gave us um, uh, the tie line uh, basically means that the chemical potential of B atoms in alpha and gamma is identical, and the chemical potential of A atoms in alpha and gamma is also identical. So even though they will be of different chemical compositions, there will be no tendency for diffusion when these are in contact, right? Because it's the free energy gradient which drives diffusion, and the free energies of carbon and iron are equal in both phases, right? So this is how we construct a, a phase diagram, is we draw a common tangent. And if we now uh, go on to a ternary system, uh, 
instead of a, a curve, we've got a free energy surface in three dimensions, and instead of a common tangent, we've got a tangent plane. And because of that, we've got an extra degree of freedom that the tangent plane can rock while still maintaining contact with those two surfaces. So we have a whole set of tie lines, and that defines the alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature, right? In the binary case, you only had one tie line at a constant temperature. So, you know, we've got to uh, actually grow something. Which tie line would I pick controlling the process? Yeah. The obvious answer is the one passing through C bar, okay? through the average composition of the steel, as in the binary case. So here, you see, um, the tie line actually passes through C bar. Um, and similarly, we would have uh, two values of C bar for carbon and manganese. And we, when we plot that on our ternary phase diagram, uh, you know, we, we ought to pick the tie line that's passing through C bar. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, so, in the binary case, we obtain the necessary equations by looking at the rate at which solute is partitioned and the rate at which it's carried away from the interface by diffusion in order to maintain the equilibrium concentrations at the interface. All right? Those two terms must be equal. For the ternary case, we have greater complexity. We, first of all, we have two equations. V is the velocity and there's only one interface moving, so the velocity is the same in both of those uh, equations here. Uh, these are the equilibrium concentrations of ferri ferrite and austenite with respect to carbon and with respect to manganese. This is the diffusion coefficient of carbon and the gradient of carbon and the diffusion coefficient of manganese and the gradient of manganese. But the flux of carbon depends not just on its own gradient but also on the gradient of manganese. So D with the subscript Mn, C is the interaction diffusion coefficient. We need, we need a set of four diffusion coefficients to define the fluxes of carbon and manganese. Okay? Right, now in order to uh, uh, simplify things, you, you now understand that the flux of carbon doesn't just depend on its own gradient. Uh, it will depend also on the gradient of manganese and vice versa. But in order to simplify things, uh, I'm, going to for the, I'm going to ignore these two terms, all right? And just focus on the two equations with this term and this term, okay? But the theory all exists. I, I just don't want to go into it. So, I'm simplifying those two equations and saying, okay, there isn't much of an interaction between carbon and manganese, and therefore we will just take those first flux terms into account. Now, what do you think is the ratio of the diffusion coefficient of carbon to manganese, roughly, at a typical temperature? Just take a guess, okay? Thousand. Hmm? Thousand. thousand, right? Yeah. Ten to the eight. Okay? <laughs> so, so, you know, no, no, it's okay. Thousand is a pretty good guess, okay? Uh, and you haven't done a calculation, and I didn't mention the temperature, but typically the difference in ratio is ten to the power of eight because carbon is an interstitial solute and manganese is not. So there's a problem, you know, we've got to satisfy both of these equations simultaneously, but the diffusivity of carbon is huge compared with manganese, and the other terms in this equation, they are different, but they are certainly not different by eight orders of magnitude, okay? So if you can't satisfy these equations simultaneously, you can't maintain equilibrium at the interface, okay? So we've got to find a way of doing that. Okay, so uh, this is all in your notes, all right? Uh, here you have ferrite, and this is the austenite phase field. So if I 
go to a high temperature when the alloy is fully osmotic, and then I cool it so that it falls within the alpha gamma phase field, but it's quite near to the osmotic uh, phase boundary. Then I'm, the driving force is going to be small. Okay, so we meet, we say there's a low supersaturation. So I've got an alloy here, and I want to pick a tie line, which will allow me which will allow the carbon and manganese fluxes to keep pace even though the diffusion coefficients are very different. Okay, so if I, if I go back to this slide, if I can pick a tie line, and now I have a choice of tie lines, if I can pick a tie line which uh, reduces the gradient of carbon to compensate for its high diffusivity, then the two equations could be satisfied simultaneously. Now, how can we pick a tie line which ensures that the gradient of carbon is reduced? Now, suppose that we can choose a tie line which makes the concentration gradient of carbon in the austenite flat. Okay, so this is C bar, this is C gamma alpha, and C alpha gamma. And what we want is this gradient to become as flat as possible. So if I choose a tie line, a tie line that makes C gamma alpha approximately equal to C bar, then the gradient becomes flat. like so, C bar, C gamma alpha, and C alpha gamma. So carbon is on the horizontal axis, so if I want the carbon concentration of the austenite to be the same as that in the alloy, then I draw a vertical construction line through that uh, alloy composition. And where it touches the gamma phase boundary defines the tie line. All right? So the tie lines exist. They, they are easily calculated using uh, thermodynamic methods. So we are not here looking at how to calculate a tie line. But any point on that phase boundary defines the tie line, which gives you the equilibrium composition of the ferrite. Okay? But you can see that the average carbon concentration in the alloy is equal to the equilibrium concentration in the austenite, so our concentration profile for carbon will be flat, and that will compensate for the large diffusion coefficient of carbon, and the manganese will be different in the ferrite and austenite, so there will be long-range diffusion of manganese. So by reducing the gradient of carbon, we compensate for its high diffusivity, and the tie line doesn't actually pass through C bar anymore. Okay? We maintain local equilibrium. In these equations, uh, we compensated for the large diffusion coefficient of carbon by making the gradient flat. Is there any other method? You know, if you, if you focus on this term, if I want to increase the flux of manganese, then I should make the gradient steep, right? So how do we make the gradient steep? Now suppose we want to make the concentration gradient of manganese steep, and uh, if I just sketch out the concentration gradient, so this is C bar, this is C gamma alpha, C alpha gamma, and this is ferrite and austenite. So I want to make this gradient steep. And obviously, that gradient is determined by the area under this triangle. So it depends on how much manganese is partitioned as the ferrite grows. Now, if I allow the manganese concentration in the ferrite to approach the average concentration in the alloy, then the amount of partitioning decreases. Of partitioning. decreases. And therefore, my concentration profile looks like so, with very little partitioning. Uh, 
Uh, so the steep gradient then compensates for the low diffusion coefficient of manganese and we are able to have the fluxes of carbon and manganese keep pace with the single interface that is moving with the velocity v and yet we are able to maintain local equilibrium at the interface for both manganese and carbon. Uh, let's do a construction in which um, the ferrite forms without much partitioning of manganese. In other words, the negligible partitioning, local equilibrium mode of transformation. So we start with a fully austenitic sample at high temperatures, and then we quench it into the alpha plus gamma phase field uh, at some location which is close to the alpha boundary. In other words, we have a high driving force for transformation. For the manganese concentration in the ferrite to be the same as that in the alloy, we draw a horizontal construction line uh, through the uh, ferrite. Where it intersects this boundary defines the tie line governing the interface compositions and therefore we get negligible partitioning of manganese and long range diffusion of carbon. So this is now uh, going to be a slow, um, uh, this is now going to be a fast reaction because we are partitioning very little manganese and manganese is usually the slow diffuser. Uh, but we are maintaining local equilibrium at the interface. So there are these two ways, the negligible partitioning local equilibrium and the partitioning local equilibrium modes for ferrite growth. Uh, how does the steel know which growth mechanism should operate under, uh, under a driving force? Well, if we take our tie lines and we divide them into uh, right-handed triangles, oh shit. So let's see how we can pick a tie line which allows the manganese concentration of the ferrite to be similar to that of the alloy so that there is very little negligible partitioning of manganese and yet we are able to maintain local equilibrium at the interface. If I draw a horizontal construction line through our alloy where it touches the ferrite uh, phase boundary that defines the tie line governing interface compositions and you can see that there's very little partitioning of manganese. In other words, we have a steep gradient of manganese to compensate for its low diffusion coefficient, whereas the carbon uh, is now um, diffusing or in the long range. So uh, this kind of uh, a transformation would happen at high supersaturations but the question is, you know, how does the steel know whether it should transform by uh, a negligible partitioning local equilibrium mode or a partitioning local equilibrium mode? So the question arises, how does an alloy know whether it should transform into ferrite with the long range diffusion of manganese or with negligible partitioning of manganese? So let's try and see whether an alloy which ought to transform by the partitioning local equilibrium mechanism. Let's see if I, what happens if I draw a horizontal construction line through it rather than a vertical construction line. So we've picked a tie line here which defines the interface compositions and you notice that the carbon concentration of the ferrite and of the austenite are both less than that of the alloy. Now that's impossible. Okay? Uh, similarly, if I take an alloy which is super cool to a high supersaturation and attempt to pick a tie line which 
here and here. Attempt to pick a tie line uh, which permits the long range diffusion of manganese, then the manganese concentrations of both ferrite and austenite are greater than of the alloy, so that's not possible. Uh, so basically, if I draw the tie lines inside my alpha plus gamma phase field and construct right-handed triangles for each one of them, then that divides the alpha plus gamma phase field into a region where the alloy can only transform by the partitioning local equilibrium or by the negligible partitioning local equilibrium mode. A better, square, uh, better sketch where I've divided the alpha plus gamma phase field into two regimes. Here you must have long range diffusion of manganese and here you will have a very steep gradient of manganese with uh, very little partitioning, negligible partitioning, so that you get a steep gradient of manganese. And um, this is the same thing illustrated again. Now, there will come a temperature where the manganese atoms are no longer able to partition at all. In other words, the manganese to iron ratio in the ferrite will remain the same as the manganese to iron ratio in the austenite. Uh, so we actually lose equilibrium because the manganese is not partitioning, but the carbon uh, still has a very high diffusion coefficient and therefore is able to partition between the austenite and the ferrite. Now it follows that the tie lines on this new phase diagram, which is not an equilibrium diagram, but we call it a para-equilibrium phase diagram because the manganese is not partitioning, will be almost horizontal because the manganese to iron ratio in the ferrite will be the same as the manganese to iron ratio in austenite. It's not exactly horizontal because the carbon concentrations in the ferrite and austenite are different but the tie lines are almost horizontal throughout this phase diagram. Notice also that this phase diagram meets at a point and that's because in the absence of carbon the, and the fact that the manganese doesn't move, there's a unique uh, concentration of manganese where the ferrite transforms into austenite. Uh, and if we superimpose the equilibrium and para-equilibrium phase diagrams, then you can see that they also meet on the horizontal axis here where the manganese concentration is zero uh, because there's no difference between equilibrium and para-equilibrium when there is no manganese in the material.